You enjoying the rain? I know you are. Boy, isn't it nice? Everything's green. Man, I love driving around now. Before that, I didn't like it at all. <laughs> it depressed me. You know, like watching the news. But driving around, seeing all that green, that's nice. It's nice. All right, we have communion today, the Lord's Supper. Be preparing yourself for that. We come to the table and experience more and more of God's grace. That's always a good thing. Kind of old home week. Scott and Vicki are back with us over here sitting by Michelle. They were uh, church members 20 years ago here. Well, not here, somewhere else. <laughs> we weren't here. <laughs> but uh, they're building uh, out in that west of Huachuca City up in those hills. So he's here running heavy equipment and getting the place ready and all that. And so they're moving into the area. That'll be fun. It's good to see Donna Lee and her sister Georgia. Hey, hey. I, I, did you leave John home? Okay, well, that's fine. That's good. The Baileys are here. We got people from everywhere, from Dragoon, from Idaho, and Tucson. From Apache Junction. That, is that part of the country? <laughs> Just checking. All right. Very good. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for today. We have come to worship you, to, to glorify your name, to be in, in your very midst, O oh God. We know that's what you've called us to, and you've said that you would be our God and we would be your people, and that we would dwell in your midst. And we look forward to that, not only here, but also in eternity, when that will be worked out for eternity. But Lord, we're here to worship you, to lift up your name, to hear your word and to obey it, and do what you've called us to do, to be the people you've called us to be. And in Jesus' name, they all said, Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. The trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more. And the morning breaks eternal bright and fair. When the saved of earth shall gather over on the other shore. And the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll, when the roll is called up yonder. When the roll is called up yonder. When the roll is called up yonder, when the roll is called yonder, I'll be there. On that bright and cloudless morning when the dead in Christ shall rise and the glory of his resurrection share. When his chosen ones shall gather to their home beyond the skies. And the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. Sing it! When the... Wow, that was good. Let us labor for the master from the dawn till setting sun. Let us talk of all his wondrous love and care. Then when all of life is over and our work on earth is done, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. All right, you're on. When the... When the roll, when the roll is called up yonder, when the roll, when the roll is called up yonder, when the roll is called up yonder, when the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. Amen. We will be there. There's a bit of a theme today in the music. Don't get scared. Don't be scared. 
But we're singing about heaven. <laughs> I'm not trying to prophesy about anybody's lifespan here. I'm just saying. <laughs> I'm satisfied with just a cottage below A little silver and a little gold But in that city where the ransom will shine I want a gold one that silver line I've got a mansion just over the hill top in that bright land where we'll never grow old and someday yonder we will never more wonder but walk on streets that our purest gold Don't think me poor Or deserted or lonely I'm not discouraged I'm heaven bound I'm but a pilgrim In search of the city I want a man a harp and a crown I've got a mansion Just over the hilltop In that bright land Where we'll never grow old And someday under We will never more wonder but walk on streets that are pure as gold I've got a mansion just over the hilltop In that bright land where we'll never grow old And someday under we will never more wander but walk on streets that are purest gold. How are you looking forward to what God can do? Hallelujah. What he has in store for those that love him. Now I know that the Bible uses terms like streets of gold. And all that, but a lot of that kind of language is anthropomorphical. I don't know if that's correctly pronounced, but you got it. Uh, it's other words, in other words, it's language that humans can understand. So, because God's trying to relate to us in things that are too beautiful for us to really grasp. And so he provides these kind of things. Uh, but that heavenly temple, that, that which is... Uh, he is creating for us that is there that we will enjoy for eternity. It's way beyond even the lyrics of songs that we sing. And I'm really excited about what that will be like. I'm not trying to do anything to get there any quicker, but I'm just saying, and I'm sure you agree with me, looking forward to what God has in store for those that love him. Because everything's in God's time. Yep. Yeah. I can only imagine what it'll be like when I walk by your side. I can only imagine what my eyes will see when your face is before me. I can only imagine I can only imagine what it be like when I walk by your side. I can only imagine what my eyes will see 
When your face is before me, I can only imagine. Surrounded by your glory, what will my heart be you? Will I dance for you, Jesus, or in all of you be still? Will I stand in your presence, or to my knees will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah, will I be able to speak at all? I can only imagine, I can only imagine. I can only imagine when that day comes when I find myself standing in the sun I can only imagine when all I will do is forever forever worship you I can only imagine Surrounded by your glory, what will my heart be healed? Will I dance for you, Jesus, or in all of you be still? Will I stand in your presence, or to my knees will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah? Will I be able to speak at all? I can only imagine. I can only imagine Surrounded by your glory What will my heart be you? Will I dance for you, Jesus? Or in all of you be still? Will I stand in your presence? Or to my knees will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah? Will I be able to speak at all? I can only imagine. I can only imagine. I can only imagine what it'll be like when I walk by your side. I can only I will be yours, you will be mine, together in eternity, our hearts of love will be entwined, together in eternity, forever in eternity. I will be yours, you will be mine, together in eternity, our hearts of love will be entwined, together in eternity, forever in eternity.
No more tears of pain in our eyes. No more fear or shame, for we will be with you. Yes, we will. tears no more tears of pain in our eyes no more fear or shame for we will be with Yes, we will be with you. We will worship. Worship you forever. We will worship, we will worship you forever. We will worship, we will worship you forever. Jesus, a holy and anointed one, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Risen and exalted one, Jesus. Your name is like honey on my lips. Your spirit like water to my soul. Your word is a lamp unto my feet. Jesus, I love you, I love you. Jesus, Jesus, holy and anointed. Jesus, 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 risen and exalted one, Jesus. 
Your name is like honey on my hay lips. Your spirit like water to my soul. Your word is a lamp unto my feet. Jesus, I love you. I love you. Jesus, Jesus, holy and anointed one, Jesus. Lord Jesus, we, we worship you. It's all about you. We've come to glorify your name. And all that we say and do, and I know, Lord God, that we're pretty shaky when it comes to that. And yet you know that. And your grace is sufficient. Lord, as we prepare our hearts for the Lord's table, we just ask that we would sense your grace and your mercy, and your kindness, and your goodness. And Father, we, we will come to the tables today expectantly, knowing that grace upon grace is available for us as we take the bread and the cup. We know all of this, Lord is made possible by your blood that was shed on the cross for us. And they all said, Amen. After this song, we'll sing together. Uh, I'll be calling the deacons up, and uh, but first I'm going to share a little devotional, and then we'll we'll take the cup and the bread and do it like we normally do with prayer groups in the different corners of the room. It's your blood that cleanses me. It's your blood that gives me life. It's your blood that took my place in redeeming sacrifice and washes me Whiter than the snow, than the snow, my Jesus, God's precious sacrifice. Okay, you sing it out, you sound great. It's your blood.
It's your blood that cleanses me. It's your blood that gives me life. It's your blood that took my place in redeeming sacrifice. Washes me. Whiter than the snow, than the snow, my Jesus, God's precious sacrifice, my Jesus, God's precious sacrifice. Before we take communion, I'd like to read a devotional to you about faith. It's from Paul David Tripp's uh, devotional, New Morning Mercies. He writes, Faith so completely takes God at his word that it is willing to do what he says and stay inside his boundaries. Faith is a response of your heart to God that completely alters the way that you live your life. You don't just think by faith, you live by faith. Now, it's important to face two implications of real living faith, and the first one is this. Faith is never simply natural for us. We aren't born with faith in God. We don't come out of the womb ready to acknowledge His existence, worship Him for His glory, and submit to His rules. We tend to live by sight, by personal experience, by collective research, and by good old intuition. But faith isn't natural. It's natural to give yourself to wonderment about mysteries in your life that you'll never solve. It's natural to imagine where you'll be in 10 or 20 years. It's natural to wonder why someone else's life has turned out so very different from yours. It's natural to panic at moments, wondering if God really does exist. And if he does, if he hears your prayers. But putting your entire existence in the hands of one whom you cannot see, touch, or hear is far from natural. And this is why faith is only ever a gift of divine grace. You and I have all the power in the world to doubt and no independent power at all to believe. So if you are living by faith, don't proudly pat yourself on the back as if you did something great. No, raise your eyes and your hands toward heaven and thank God for gifting you with the desire and the ability to believe. 
The second point is participating in formal Christianity is part of a life of faith. But it does not define the life of faith. Just because you participate in the scheduled programs of your church doesn't mean you're a person of faith. You can praise God for His wisdom in that service on Sunday, but be breaking His law on Tuesday because at street level, you really do think you're smarter than Him. You can sing in thanks for His grace on Sunday and resist the work of that grace the rest of the week. It's so easy to swindle yourself into believing that you're living by faith when you're really not. So, look into the mirror of Hebrews chapter 11 and examine your faith. You don't need to do that fearfully anxious at what you'll see. You don't need to deny the reality of your spiritual struggle or act as if you're something that you're not. You don't have to fear exposure because your struggle of faith has been more than adequately addressed by the grace of the cross of the Lord Jesus. Run to Him. Confess the off and on again faith of your heart. He will not turn you away. If I could have the deacons come forward. Yeah? Man, good worship. All you people were singing. Oh, man, it blessed my heart. And come to the table, receive grace upon grace. Good fellowship, just a great day. We're in Acts chapter 16, I've entitled this D-Day for Europe. Let's go ahead and look, I'm going to read that, you can read along with me if you wish. Uh, if you need a copy of the message, they're up here in the front. Acts 16, beginning with verse 11. So setting sail from Troas... We made a direct voyage to Samothrace and, following day, and the following day to Neapolis and from there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. We remained in this city some days and on the Sabbath day we went outside the gate to the riverside where we supposed there was a place of prayer and we sat down and spoke to the women who had come together. One who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. And after she was baptized in her household as well, she urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, Come to my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. Well, I imagine she did. Keep nagging at somebody, they'll do it. Anyways, <laughs> that's my, I'm just setting you up. We remember last week we were talking uh, about all that was going on. I'm trying to remember what was going on there. Huh. Anyways, Paul and company were being prepared, they were getting ready, they were headed out because, oh, the Macedonian vision, they had the vision, Paul had the vision at night. You know, <clears throat> this is after God had restricted them from going south in Turkey, which was modern-day Turkey, south, and then they said, well, let's go north, and then God puts a roadblock there, they can't go north, and if you look at the map, you see what's happening, they're being funneled right into Europe, and so now we pick up where we left off there. Because Europe is what God is after at this point in time. Paul's first evangelistic victory on the continent of Europe involved a Gentile woman. Now, hold on. This gets funny after a while. 
If you think God doesn't have a sense of humor, hang in there. You're going to see some really interesting stuff that occur, especially to Paul, of all people. She was a God-fearer who worshipped the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It appears that in this one evangelistic event, God purposely and visibly confronts religious bigotry, sexism, and ungodly forms of nationalism. Yes, there are ungodly forms of nationalism. The conversion of Lydia as the first European convert just drips with irony and, in my estimation, lots of humor. God, you see, you know this, God is not a respecter of persons, right? We all know that verse. The ground is level at the foot of the cross, and all are on equal footing regarding salvation. Now, Paul's in Philippi. They head down to the, the Gangaitis River outside of Philippi to locate a group of praying Jews. Well, it proves fruitful. See, they're looking for somebody to witness to. And as we will see later, there was no synagogue in Philippi. So that explains some of the movements of Paul. Paul hit the jackpot when he found this worshiping group of Philippian Jews and Gentiles, God-fearers, all of whom happened to be women. This did not cause Paul to skip a beat regarding his mission. For Paul, you see, the makeup of the audience doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is the message, the gospel, the kingdom of God. You see, he's not the chauvinist, chauvinist, if you like it that way. Modern feminism has branded him. And we'll see that as we explore. Lydia was about to meet the God who had called her from before the world was formed. She was on schedule to receive a divine heart transplant. She wouldn't need health insurance, vaccinations, and no masks are required when Dr. Jesus does the surgery. The account of the conversion of Lydia provides a view into the heart of God. We will see that all who answer the gospel call, which means to be saved, are the children of God and equal in value in the eyes of the Father. This truth should not be perverted by racists or state-worshipping idolaters. This truth should not be hijacked by feminists who deny God's creative order within the earth, the church, and the family, for they've been doing that for a while. Men and women are equal, but they're not the same. Check out an anatomy textbook. You don't even need to read it. Just look at the pictures. You'll know we're different. <laughs> Men and women were created to fulfill God's purposes in the earth for one thing, to glorify Him. That's why we're here. The chief end of, of man is to glorify God. Any other opinion is rebellion, and it's under God's judgment. There's plenty of food for thought in these five verses about Lydia that we're going to look at. There's just so much in there. And, and when you slow down and start looking at a text in the Scriptures, and just take your time. I know we're all on Bible reading programs, and we want to get through it, get our chapter done for the day, and move on to whatever else, a devotion, or, or whatever else we're doing, prayer. It's all good stuff. But sometimes we miss stuff because we're not taking the time to look at the Scripture and really ask God, what are you saying here? What's going on here? So our first point of order is, what I call smooth sailing and winged victory. Now, Paul, Silas, Timothy, and Luke, wouldn't you like to have those four come and meet your, your Bible study group, your care group, or whatever? That's what's going on here. These are four superstars. Of course, they didn't know it then. But they show up. Wow, that would be amazing. They're heeding the call to Macedonia. Because Paul had that vision where the man from Macedonia was standing up and calling out to them over the Aegean Sea, come, come help us. And so they all 
pooled their thoughts together and said, you know, God restricted us from going here. And we saw him set up circumstances to keep us from going here. And the only place that we could actually go is towards the coast. And that's the vision that you had. The guy was called, telling us to get over there and help him. And they're all in agreement. We read that last week. This is D-Day for the European continent. Now, the gospel will eventually conquer the continent of Europe, and it will become the dominant religion for two millennia. And I've got a note there, if you're reading on, that's not necessarily a good thing. If you've done any reading about church history, you'll know that the dominant religion often corrupts people quite easily. And then they start buying and selling offices, and it goes way off the rails. Christianity works best when it's under tribulation. We have a tendency to stay focused on the things that matter. Just a side thought, and take that with you. And there's the, the route. They started in Troas. Samothrace is there in the circle. That's the island. They crossed over again the next day. Neapolis, and then they walked to Philippi. After concluding that Paul's vision of the Macedonian man calling for help was a providential sign from God, the mission team boarded a ship, and with the wind at their backs, they sailed smoothly to the island of Samothrace. Now, the Greek meaning, I don't know what version of Bible you're looking at, but if you're looking at the, the notes, you'll see that it says they had a direct voyage, or they had a straight course. That's a nautical term. That's a navy term. That's a seafaring term, which is saying that it was smooth sailing. The wind was at their backs. They were sailing. The wind was right. They were all, you know, doing the uh, Leonardo DiCaprio thing on the prow of the ship, you know, oh, look at me, you know, and, and just, just going, going to do what God had called them to do. They were excited. Not only did they understand now what God wanted them to do, he was helping them. He was removing obstacles in front, and he was pushing from the back. The wind was so perfect that the ship covered the 156 miles to Samothrace in just two days. Now, on another occasion in the book of Acts, we'll see that somebody else made that trip. It took five days. So they had some real help getting there. This fortunate weather solidified the team's opinion that God was propelling them forward to announce the gospel of grace to Europe. Have you ever experienced the wind of the Spirit filling your sails while you're doing ministry? It feels as if God is sweeping away the obstacles in your path and propelling you from behind. It's a season of smooth sailing. We call these mountaintop experiences, and we do love them. Amen? You can't beat that stuff. And we praise God for them. However, as we all know, seasons change. Our Father knows that we need experience dealing with both smooth and rough sailing. When you're dealing with rough sailing, we're back to that uh, devotional about faith. You know, faith is just a teaching until you use it. We need to be ready in season and out to accomplish our God-given assignments over the long haul. We need to be ready in season and out, prepared at all times, regardless of what the winds look like, regardless of the waves, being ready at any time that God would call us to serve Him. I mean, we don't know what's coming up. We don't know what He has in store. We may be we may be entering into a Macedonian call ourselves and not even realize it. Maybe we didn't have a vision, but we're feeling God pulling us, propelling us in a certain direction because he's got an assignment for us that needs to be done. Do you realize what an honor that is? 
that God would pick you to go do that. He knows you. He knows your, your failures. He knows your successes. He knows you didn't want to go. He knows he had to drag you. He knows all that stuff, but it's okay because he knows you. And he knows way in here you want to serve it. The island of Samothrace was the home of the famous statue of Nike, the Greek goddess of victory. Now on the left you see what the statue looks like today because anything that extends gets knocked off throughout history, right? Her head's gone, her arm's gone, okay? But the, you got an artist rendering in the middle there with the green and the, the brown wings and all that. What he thought it probably looked like originally. The statue was called, because it was Nike, it was called the Winged Victory of Samothrace, or the Nike of Samothrace. The statue is 18 feet tall. It's a Hellenist design in Greek. It's a marble sculpture created around the second century BC to commemorate a successful sea battle. That artful flowing drapery of her outfit there conveys a sense of action and triumph as though the goddess was descending to a light upon the prow of a ship, the very front. Nike's swoosh logo, which is right there, represents the sound of Nike's wings in flight. It is the sound of winged victory. So if you've got Nike shoes, that's winged victory. You can run faster, jump higher. Oh, those are PF flyers. Never mind. <laughs> now I'm dating myself, right? Okay. Now, it's not part of the scripture record, but there is an irony exhibited here as Paul's mission can be compared with the winged victory of Nike. As the missionaries advanced by the Holy Spirit's favorable wind, we see them stationed as if on the prow of God's ship. They portray a sense of divine action and triumph. All of this just seems fitting. I know I'm drawing some conclusions that aren't in there, but I just kind of sense that as I'm looking through it and seeing the history behind it. Man, these guys are on a roll. They, they got a vision. They're on a mission for God. And they've headed across the sea. They've hit the port. They've walked to Philippi, and they got the wind at their back. God has called them to something great, and they're all excited about it. It's a good thing. It's winged victory, if you will. From Samothrace to Neapolis, the port city of Philippi to there, it was, it was just even more smooth sailing. And once they hit the European beach at Neapolis, they began an eight-mile walk to Philippi. I was thinking about that. An eight mile walk. And they got to take their stuff too. See, we get aggravated when our rental car isn't ready once we arrive at the airport. If we had experienced this, we'd be downright apoplectic. If we had to walk eight miles after dealing with the frustrations of air travel, that'd be nuts. But the steadfastness of Paul's team should cause us to pause and reflect on our lackadaisical attitude toward fulfilling the Great Commission. See, the question arises out of this, how far would I be willing to walk or to drive, to sail, or to fly to share the good news of Jesus Christ? This is very convicting stuff. Across the yard, would I go that far to the neighbor? Across town, across the country, even across the globe? You see, we're kind of spoiled and we're extremely ambivalent and lethargic when it comes to fulfilling the Great Commission. It's not criticism, that's just a fact. We're like that. We've had it quite, quite good in our lifetimes here. And we know that 
we can help the Great Commission. All we got to do is write a check. Nothing wrong with money. Trust me. Oh, all of God's missions and all that is moved by money. But it takes somebody with a heart that's willing to go even if the money doesn't show up. That's what God's looking for. Now, we know that not all people, so don't get a guilt complex here. Not everybody is called to full-time missionary work. That's, that's obvious. That's a very specialized calling. You know, the, the patterns up here on the, one of the banners. That's an extremely specialized calling to do that that they're doing. However, we are all called to fulfill the Great Commission within the limitations that God has providentially provided us, our boundaries. God knows where he has you. He knows the boundaries he's given you, and he knows what he said as far as the Great Commission. He knows all of that. So I encourage you, I encourage me, I encourage anyone that's hearing this in the days to come. Pray. Ask God what his assignment is for you. Tell him you want to be a faithful servant of the king and that you want to proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God. That is our assignment. It's not like you're doing him a favor. He already spoke that. Now, I will guarantee you, and I do not guarantee things very often, but I guarantee you he'll answer you. You know why? Because you're praying according to his will. So hang on. Buckle up. Be prepared for some divinely creative assignments. And that does, it doesn't even have to involve going anywhere. It, it, it's God that puts this together. He knows the limitations he's provided you. He knows where he's got you. And, and all he's saying is, will you trust me? Will you do what I've asked you to do? Will you go out? I saved you. Don't you want that for someone else? Well, the second point is Philippi, interesting town. The ancient town of Philippi was renamed in 356 B.C. by Philip II of Macedon after himself. So it is a good thing to be king. You can name cities after yourself and all that. Later, in 167 B.C., it became a Roman possession. and <laughs> Nothing lasts forever. There's always a bigger bully on the block coming along. The fame of Philippi centers on a decisive battle in the Second Roman Civil War. That was 42 B.C. And Philippi is the place where the armies of Mark Antony and Octavian defeated Brutus and Cassius. Very famous as far as Roman battles go. For Philippi's part in the battle, they helped. It was awarded the status of a Roman colony. Doesn't get any better than that during those times. And they answered directly to the Roman Empire. They didn't have to go through a prefect here, a governor there, this, that, the other. Regardless, it could go straight up to the emperor himself. That's pretty high status. Now, because it had that kind of status, that kind of pride, it attracted retiring Roman soldiers. <laughs> Maybe think of Fort Huachuca. And its citizens were exempt from provincial taxes. That didn't fit, so I couldn't say that. I'm still paying lots of taxes. But there was a lot of civic pride in this Roman colony. Paul and his team, they were in for a complete cross-cultural missionary experience. Little did Philippi know that history was about to be made. As the battle flag of Christ was planted on their soil. You know why? Because Jesus is king, not Caesar. The kingdom of God rules, not Rome. The church at Philippi is going to go down in history as one of Paul's most beloved congregations. 
he writes this, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you. Wow. That'd be pretty cool, wouldn't it? Philippi was a prosperous city. Apparently, the converts in Philippi had been financially blessed, and they shared that blessing by supporting God's work through Paul. And you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. Wow. To have the great apostle say that about you, about your church. It'd be impressive. It'd be powerful. It's easy to see why God chose Philippi as the beachhead for his European campaign. It was a prosperous Roman colony full of Roman pride, and thus it was full of pagan religions. It was the perfect place to launch the European mission. The opposition would be fierce, but God would be glorified as many would come to faith in Christ. Philippi was teeming with Gentiles who were appointed to eternal life. They would respond to the gospel call, and in obedience they would help finance God's work. Well, so now we get, out of these five verses, we get to the heroine of the story, Lydia, first convert in Europe. Now, as we've talked about before, Paul's preferred evangelistic plan of attack was to attend the local synagogue on the Sabbath, make inroads with that congregation by teaching and demonstrating that Jesus was the long-awaited Messiah, and that group could understand the language. They could understand where he was coming from. That's why he went to them. And then afterwards... He'd do follow-up. They'd ask him, could you come back next week and teach us some more? And then he'd go from house to house teaching them through the week and come back to the synagogue the next week. But that plan had to go by the wayside because Philippi had no synagogue, which tells us it had a very small Jewish population there. There has to be at least 10 male heads of households to form a synagogue. If that required was not met, the second course of action was to meet near any body of water. And that's because of ablutions and baptisms that they did and different things with water. And they would meet and they would recite the Shema, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one, taken out of Deuteronomy. They would say their prayers there at the riverside or the lakeside, and they'd read the Law and Prophets. They'd basically have a church meeting outside in God's great earth, in nature. Now, Paul had to alter his plan. He didn't mind. And on the Sabbath, he went outside the city to locate a body of observant Jews. He knew from experience, historically, that if they didn't have a synagogue, there was some of them meeting somewhere near a body of water. And the Gangadish River just went right by here. So off he goes, him and Luke and Silas and Timothy, going out to find out where they're meeting. And they did find a small group of women at a place of prayer on the bank of the Gangadish River. Now, this is a divine appointment. Remember Jesus and the woman at the well and how he was just waiting for her there at the middle of the day at noon? And she came to draw water. She came at noon because she couldn't come when all the other women were there because they made fun of her. Because she's a little bit loose, morally speaking, and was kind of uh, pushed aside by all the good girls. So she came. Who was waiting for? Jesus was waiting for. It was a divine appointment. It wasn't an accident. All the disciples had taken off to go buy bread, but they went in a group because they were afraid of the Samaritans. He was there waiting. Same thing here. This is a divine appointment. 
And what it's going to do is going to bless and it's going to disrupt this Gentile territory that it occurs in. Same thing happened in Samaria with the Samaritan woman at the well. It disrupted everything and the gospel went forward. And people just naturally freak out when the gospel is going forward. You see, the gospel is a battle cry that demands allegiance to Christ the King and Him only. The gospel divides people and disrupts sinful rebellion. Proclaiming the gospel is not for faint of heart, namby-pamby wimps who want an easy road in this life with no speed bumps. During Jesus' earthly ministry, He did not hide this truth from those who are wanting to follow him. Matthew 10, 34. Do not think that I came to bring peace to the earth. Huh? Hold on. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a person's enemies will be those of his own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Boy, that's strict stuff. Whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, but I thought Jesus was the Prince of Peace. He is. However, the peace he provides is peace with God for believers who have been saved from God's wrath. His peace will culminate in eternal peace for the people of God after God's enemies are judged. Prior to the day of the Lord, it's a continuous battle for souls, day in and day out. And that is why our weapons are spiritual and not physical. That's why we're equipped to do spiritual warfare. There's your Prince of Peace. He's not the pasty-looking European guy that looks halfway... Anyways. <laughs> He's a warrior. He's God Almighty. And the peace that he brings is his peace for those who have taken on the very righteousness of Christ. You see, the wrath of God will come. The wrath of God is poured out on the ungodly. The wrath of God will not alight on the righteous. God has provided a way of escape through His Son so that we don't have to face this. We don't have to see Him coming at us with that sword ready for judgment. Because as we saw today, we are part of the new covenant in his blood. We are the very righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. The city of Thyatira's ancient name was Lydia. That's what it used to be. Lydia a prosperous businesswoman who dealt in purple dyed goods, was evidently named originally for her native province. She was a Gentile God-fearer. This means that she aligned herself with the God of the Jews. She saw truth in the Scriptures and wanted it for herself. She was a worshiper of God, and the Holy Spirit had been drawing her to Christ for some time. And as we know, Jesus said that. John 6, 44. No one, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up on the last day. You didn't just come to your senses one day and say, you know what, I think I'll just choose Jesus today. 
I think I'll do God a favor. I'll join up with his team. You didn't choose him. He chose you. And he drew you to himself. Anybody that thinks that they had a part in their salvation is misguided. Because if you think you had a part, then you can boast. And Paul's very clear about that. Can't boast. Because God did it all. And Lydia is a prime example. That's why we see her here in Acts as we're moving our way through. She had been divinely prepared for this moment. As Paul preached the good news of Jesus Christ, her heart was regenerated. So she understood what, what God was trying to say. The Lord opened her heart. That's a term for regeneration or being born again. And she put her faith in Christ in one predestined moment. Look that up in Romans 8, 29. Lydia heard the gospel call, was regenerated, born again, so that she was able to believe and was converted. The list is up there if you, need, if you can see that far. She was justified and adopted into the family of God. Thus, one woman's regenerated heart in Philippi signaled the end of the mighty Roman Empire. We can say that. From history, we can look back. Caesar is not king. Jesus is king of kings and lord of lords. He demands total allegiance from his followers, not just every now and then. Let's look at the transformation of Paul. And I told you about the irony. I told you about the humor I find in this. The man in Paul's Macedonian vision turned out to be a woman. Come on, that's funny. I don't care who you are. It's hysterical. Paul's early Pharisaic training was replete, just overflowing with prejudices against all types of people. Pharisees were taught to pray thusly. God, I thank you that I'm not a Gentile or a slave or a woman. Now, you're starting to get the humor here. It's funny when you stop to think about the many ways that God instructs us and corrects us daily through his word. See, Paul thought that was the right thing to think early on in his ministry. He was taught that. But then God, Jesus Christ, got a hold of him, pulled him into his own seminary there for about three years and taught him. He said, here's how all of this works. One of the great difficulties for believers is to submit to the slaying of our sacred cows, or more accurately, our false belief systems. The more we submit to God's word, the more we realize. We realize our pervasive lust of the eyes and lust of the flesh and the boastful pride of life that's just all over us. But as we feed on God's word, we will simultaneously begin rejecting secular worldviews that we grew up believing. Was Paul a male chauvinist pig as a Methodist female pastor declared to me? No, she actually yelled it at me, but that's another story. No, he was not. Paul's one-on-one -on -one seminary training with Jesus realigned Paul's thinking to that of the mind of Christ and the inerrancy of God's word. Inerrancy means no errors. Everything God wants you to know is right there in the scriptures. It's not wrong. I don't care what liberal professor is trying to tell you it is. It's solid. It's inspired. It's without error. Thus, it was Paul who would later write regarding the inherent equality within God's salvation, Galatians 3.28. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. He's talking about the ground is level at the foot of the cross. No one is better than anyone else when it comes to salvation. But did you notice the three groups he chose? 
They were refutations of what he had been taught as a Pharisee. Oh, God, thank you that you didn't make me a Gentile, a slave, or a woman. They're all three right there. Tell me God doesn't have a sense of humor. Paul's Pharisaic prayer of prideful superiority just blew up in his face at that point, but he was probably already ready. God already had to set him up. I just find the whole thing humorous, how it worked out. His new understanding eliminated fleshly bigotry regarding ethnicity, socioeconomic position, and sexism in the kingdom of God. All believers are equally saved and equally called to serve Christ. God, however, reserves the right to limit His callings as He sees fit. Did you hear that? He reserves the right to limit His callings as He sees fit. And this isn't up to a vote or a debate about changing cultural sensitivities. God does not change His truth to fit our wokeness. Whoa, rough crowd. Paul's new spiritual awareness does not lend scriptural support to the rebellion that's found in secular or Christian feminism. And just to clarify, Christian feminism is a contradiction in terms. It's the actual, it's the same rebellion that reared its ugly head in Eden. Let us not forget that Paul's dedication to the inerrancy of scripture supports his stance against women having teaching authority over men in the church. And he proves that in his teaching. He proves that it's not ruled and valid by cultural changes. That's the big thing that modern feminism said. Well, they had a different culture. That was the patriarchy. Things that we've grown smarter. We've grown wiser. We don't have... No, I'm sorry, because Paul solidifies his position not through the culture, not through opinion, he goes back to Genesis and said, this is what God said. 1 Timothy 2, 12-13, And do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. That doesn't mean she doesn't talk in church. That means she doesn't get all blabbermouth about how she wants this and she wants that. That's what it's talking about. Causing a disruption. Because I want that position. Or I want... He said, no, 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 no. stop that stuff. Why? Because Adam was formed first, then Eve. That's a theological position. Once again, Paul proves his argument about order in the home with this theological stance that's found in 1 Corinthians 11, which is also derived from Genesis 2. Let's look at that. Oh, you can read that while we're looking. But I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ. The head of a wife is her husband. The head of Christ is God. All right, so he says that, and that causes heartburn in a lot of places. In Ephesians 5, Paul spoke of order in the home as a reflection of Christ and his love for his bride, the church. Ephesians 5, 22, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husband. Boy, that causes all sorts of fireworks. But here's the funny thing about it all. Galatians 3.28 is the Christian feminist favorite verse. But if that's the inerrant word of God, so also is 1 Timothy, 1 Corinthians, Ephesians, and Genesis. You don't get to pick and choose. But you can find out what God's trying to say. That's acceptable. What does he mean? And we did all that in a women's Bible study years ago, and all, you know, we can talk about it anytime you want. You don't have time today. But Paul is showing us that God's word is true and accurate and can be trusted in any situation. And God is showing through the salvation of Lydia, that he is not a respecter of persons. He loves male and female exactly alike because they complement one another. If the argument is complementarianism versus egalitarianism, 
can read that on your own. So why did I stop for a few seconds on this very touchy subject? Well, first of all, the story of Lydia opens the door to much controversy regarding God's created order of man and woman. The thing with Lydia is if you get into any reading about feminism, Christian feminism versus the patriarchy versus comparing this, attacking that, Lydia will come up. So will a lot of other people. So you've got to be ready to, to deal with it. Broaching the subject always necess necessitates the need to teach the whole counsel of God and not just that which tickles your politically correct funny bone. The second reason flows from the first. If we're going to be good messengers of the Great Commission, we need to teach everything Jesus taught us. And that includes the inspired word he gave to Paul. You know the Great Commission, go therefore make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So Europe has its first convert. Many more that are appointed to salvation will answer the gospel call and put their faith in Christ. Paul's team was on a roll with the wind at their backs and the Holy Spirit leading. It appeared to be a season of smooth sailing. But any sailor will tell you that storms can materialize at any moment. Paul's crew was headed directly into some rough weather. And we'll look at that in the weeks to come. Wrap it up. God sends us to preach the gospel in all kinds of spiritual weather. Smooth or broiling seas. Doesn't matter. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. It is for boys, girls, men, and women. That's four classes made up of two genders, male and female. There are only two genders according to God's word. All other attempts at gender designation are lies. The kingdom of God is under unrelenting attack. God's word is constantly ridiculed, rejected, and maligned in the world, and sadly also within the church. Regardless, we are on the attack preaching the gospel and teaching the full counsel of God in all kinds of spiritual weather, in season and out of season. God's battle flag was planted at Calvary. Our victory is assured because of God's victory in Christ, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against Christ and his church. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. The things you show us, so, so, Lord, this stuff, there's so much in there that we've got to slow down and see what you're saying and what kind of stuff you're covering. And uh, Father, so often, once we really dig deep into that gold mine, which is your word, all of a sudden we begin to get uneasy knowing that you're about to slay one of our sacred cows. But to that, we say thank you. Do what you got to do so that we could be more like Christ. Conform us to his image, O oh God, as you promised. It's in Jesus' name we ask. Amen.